Next, we're going to have a presentation by Adam Jessel uh, on student conduct. And then after that, it's lunch. So. All right, good morning, everybody. I'm Adam Jessel. I'm the director of student conduct. Uh, obviously, I'm right before lunch and keeping you from food. So I will try to move th through this as quickly as possible. Um, our office is primarily associated with operating the university's student conduct system. Um, so if you've ever interacted, you don't have to raise your hands uh, with our office or a similar office at your previous institution. Um, what we normally do and what we're normally involved with is undergraduate students. The bulk of uh, the incidents reported to my office um, don't relate to graduate students, but I want to kind of give you an overview in case you ever do interact with my office, either as a reporting party or as a respondent in our system. Um, one thing that's important to note um, is there's more information on our website, so if you're ever interested, for whatever reason, um, in knowing about the processes and procedures associated with uh, the conduct system, you feel free to go there, and there's a, um, a link at the end of the presentation. Um, and you can also contact me if you ever have any questions. So uh, really quickly, just hope you understand at the end of the presentation what what we do here at WSU, um, understand it briefly the conduct process, kind of a broad overview. Um, also going to dive into, by virtue of being uh, graduate students and some of you having positions of employment, um, you do have some uh, roles and obligations to the institution. Um, and also want to touch briefly, because most of the instance that you'll be involved with, not as an accused student, um, but are reporting academic integrity violations to our office. Uh, that's our, our mission. I'm not going to read it out loud because obviously it's up there. Um, but what our job is primarily is upholding the standards of conduct, making sure students have a right to due process within the conduct system, and protecting the university community. Um, we're very different than a criminal court or a civil court in the sense that I primarily identify as an educator, so students make mistakes. Uh, my job is to somehow provide them with educational sanctions after those incidents so that they matriculate and graduate from the institution. Um, we process, and this is going to seem like a large number, about 4,000 incidents per year, um, but it's about less percent uh, than 10 percent of our student population. A bulk of those are minor alcohol and drug violations, about 60 percent. So the goals of the WSU conduct system, this is not unlike any other institution you may have been at uh, previously to WSU. Um, they're to educate students or, st or student organizations, deter future misconduct, assist the students involved, and protect the community. Um, obviously, Pullman being Pullman, uh, the university is very intricately involved in the Pullman community, or excuse me, WSU being part of Pullman. Um, so we get reports from Pullman police officers, the Pullman police pretty regularly, and university, uh, excuse me, community members outside the university. The purpose of the standards of conduct, they set conditions on your enrollment as a graduate student, but also the conditions of other students involved in the process and uh, um, involved with the institution. These are all the uh, I guess the list of prescribed conduct here at WSU. Again, not dissimilar from any other institution you previously attended. Um, I've highlighted the two that probably you'll mostly interact with, um, or the mostly that our office interacts with, are alcohol and drugs, like I mentioned before, and acts of dishonesty, which includes academic integrity violations. It's important to note that uh, the standards of conduct apply to both on and off campus conduct. Um, off-campus conduct to the extent that it adversely affects the university community. Um, so that includes any behavior that may include, uh, occur in Pullman, uh, the Pullman area, um, but also if you're on an internship and you happen to be in Texas or somewhere else and it gets reported to my office, that's a university program, so uh, it would fall under the standards of conduct. It applies to all students, including graduate students, part-time students, professional students, and it applies from the minute you apply to WSU through the awarding of your actual degree. I touched briefly on the differences between, I guess I highlighted the difference between our process and the criminal process. Um, obviously, the criminal process is intended to punish and deter, whereas our process is intended to be more educational. Um, students might feel like it's punishment, of course. Um, and so my job is to somehow articulate why that is an educational measure. Again, because most of our cases are alcohol and drug related, um, we work really closely with some university partners to provide alcohol and drug related education. So 
So this is fairly complex, so I'm just going to rush through it. Um, again, more information, and including this chart, is on our website. But anytime we get a report of a violation of the code of conduct, um, any person that is a respondent will be receiving a letter from my office. And that comes via WSU email. Um, uh, the new policy being that that's the primary email that we communicate with students. Um, what's important to know is that if you get a letter from us, we haven't made a predetermination on the outcome of whatever particular case. It's just once we receive a report, we're obligated to move forward with it. Um, but that does give you an opportunity to come in and talk to someone in my office about your side of the story, essentially, and dispute any of the charges or anything like that. So there is an opportunity for a hearing. There's also an opportunity for appeal, which is noted in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, so you do have the right to appeal any decision uh, issued by my office. Because the majority of our cases are alcohol and drug related, I want to highlight that particular policy. Um, obviously, it applies to students that violate uh, state and local and federal law, so under 21, drinking alcohol. Um, over 21, if you're publicly intoxicated, get a DUI, reckless driving, that type of thing, while under the influence of intoxicants. Um, but most importantly, the state law um, for marijuana allows for the use of marijuana if you're over the age of 21 and in the privacy of your own home. Um, WCU receives federal funds, so any uh, marijuana use on campus um, or if it violates the state law is a violation of our uh, university policy and a violation of the code of conduct. So smoking marijuana on campus, using marijuana on campus, um, even if you are abiding by the state law is a violation of the code. Other important policies to know, um, downloading and sharing files or software. Uh, this is less frequent these days, but uh, back in the days of Napster and downloading music illegally, we got a lot of reports from uh, folks that, that were illegally downloading music on the university's uh, wireless system and internet system. Don't see that as frequently. Um, one other thing I want to note is that we do have a good Samaritan guideline, so if someone calls, voluntarily calls uh, emergency services to help a friend in need uh, because of alcohol and drug related uh, consumption, um, that wouldn't be a violation of the code of conduct. So we do have that built into our system to allow for that type of flexibility. Um, it's my understanding that you already got training from the Office of Equal Opportunity, so they probably discussed it, uh, Executive Policy 15 and your reporting obligations under that if you happen to be a, um, employed by the university. So I'm not going to go over that again. Within mandated reporting, um, any employee at WSU, just to reiterate this, must report sexual assault, stalking, or violence, allegations of discrimination, harassment, abuse of a child or vulnerable adult, imminent harm or self to others, and hazing. So that's a particular issue that you probably haven't talked about today is, as it relates to hazing. We have never received a report from a graduate student relating to hazing, knock on wood. So, but if you did receive it from maybe an undergraduate in your class, you'd be obligated to report it to my office. Um, 48 hours is generally the standard time frame to report those type of incidents. You know, one thing back here is that, and maybe the OEO touched on this, is that if you yourself receive a report, you know, the best thing that I could recommend is if it's an Im imminent harm or danger, call the police, obviously. Um, but talk to your department chair, supervisor, because um, they'll actually have more information and can relay it to us more distinctly. But you feel free to call us at any time or uh, send me an email. I always try to highlight when in doubt, report. If you ever have that question in your gut of like, well, should I or shouldn't I, just go ahead and report it and then we'll take care of the rest. Um, that covers you um, and your obligations and then puts the obligation on us to move forward with anything that we need to do from the university perspective. Okay, so academic integrity. Again, this is a large majority of the cases that you as reporting parties will be involved with. So I wanna highlight that system. Um, and kind of some statistics within that. Um, at WSU, the, in the academic integrity system, the instructor is the primary decision maker. So they're the ones that makes the initial decision on whether an academic integrity violation has occurred. Um, then if an instructor feels that they, well, I guess I'll jump into st statistics. So between uh, July 1st, 2014 and July 1st, 2015, um, most of our cases were cheating and plagiarism, about 170 of them. Um, it's about five new reports per week. Obviously those are more heavy during finals and midterms and other times of the year, um, but it averages about to about five a week. Um, 
most of those cases, as you can see, are the student is found responsible for the violation. So what that tells me is that uh, most of the time, instructors are making the right decision as it relates to academic integrity. So if you ever have a hunch or think someone is cheating in one of your classrooms or committed plagiarism, just talk to the responsible instructor of that course. These are the definitions of academic integrity violations. It doesn't just encompass cheating and plagiarism. Um, there's other things that we've, we've seen in the past, very creative things that we've seen in the past uh, students use, um, including unauthorized collaboration. So they're texting during an exam when cell phones are prohibited, um, uh, using unauthorized multiple submissions. Sabotage and falsifying records, those are most commonly in internship programs. So students will oftentimes, uh, not oftentimes, but will submit internship reports recording hours they didn't actually work and signing off on, on behalf of the internship. Um, that's considered an act of dishonesty, obviously, within the system. The three most common are unauthorized assistance, so use of unauthorized materials and taking quizzes, tests, and examination, or, uh, and this is important, giving or receiving unauthorized assistance. So in those type of situations, both the student receiving the unauthorized assistance and the student giving the unauthorized assistance are a violation of the uh, code of conduct. Fabrication, uh, most common form, as I noted, is a record of internship or practicum experiences, and by far, I think it's about 90% are plagiarism. So as I noted before, within that system, the instructor um, makes the primary determination. Oftentimes in your interaction, if you're a teaching assistant, um, will be coming to the instructor with information that you may have witnessed or received um, about an alleged violation. And then the instructor will kind of take it from there and make the decision. But we may be contacting you at some point in time in that process to kind of gather more information, make sure we have everything documented appropriately. Um, if the instructor does find a student responsible, then the student has a right to appeal to an academic integrity hearing board. That board is a separate and distinct board from any of our conduct boards. Um, they're actually made up of tenured faculty that they review a decision and basically decide was there cheating and did the instructor assign the academic a sanction um, in accordance with the syllabus. And then once that decision is made, our office assigns educational sanctions. So that can include a tutorial about plagiarism, something about ethics and integrity, um, a research paper about cheating. So we're trying to pair the academic sanction with some sort of educational sanction as well. I'm just going to jam through most of this because I'm keeping you from lunch. One thing that's important is uh, the syllabus statement. Uh, the way the university views the syllabus is really as a contract between the instructor and the student. So it's important those syllabus statements for whatever course that you might be involved in as a student, but also if you're helping teach, uh, as a teaching assistant that you read that, because it will identify what happens when an academic integrity violation occurs. Um, the reason that it's important that it is in there is that if a student doesn't have a notice of what will happen if there is an academic integrity violation, then it's difficult, if not impossible, to uphold those type of standards. Um, so if you're looking at a syllabus, you want to articulate the standards that you're only willing to enforce, allow students to understand the consequences of their dishonesty, and clarify academic and behavioral standards in advance. Um, more information on that, we have sample syllabus statements on our website. So it's something you can always go you know, plagiarize from us um, if you want to. So briefly, covering uh, resources, uh, on our website for faculty is working with Disruptive Students Guide. Uh, things come up sometimes in your classrooms that may not rise to the level of a violation of the code of conduct, but are just disruptive to the general course environment. Um, we have a really good guide that we've put together on how to kind of handle those issues and various resources that are available, and that's a really valuable tool. tool. Um, I recommend that you read it in advance before teaching any course because it is really valuable. Um, also, we have various academic integrity related resources on our website. As a student, uh, on our website we have campus community resources, so if you're ever um, interested in accessing university resources that you didn't know you were aware of, um, or that maybe you're having trouble academically or in need of some counseling, that's all available on our website. Um, and also some related student information about calendaring for courses, et cetera. So we try to have a central location for anything that you may need in that process. Another good resource is the Dean of Students um, and the Ombud. Um, they're both good resources for you, not only as a student, 
but it was an employee of the institution. So, a couple shameless plugs. Um, opportunities in my office. Obviously, if you have a course um, or in a course of study that you might be interested in volunteering in our office, we have uh, conduct and appeals boards that are, are really interesting, I think at least, but that's my job. Um, and uh, we have uh, graduate students that regularly apply and serve. Um, and from my perspective, they enjoy it. Um, I guess you wouldn't apply if you wouldn't enjoy it. Um, but if you have any questions about what that looks like, you can always contact me directly. Um, the other thing is that if you're talking to an instructor and maybe there's an issue that's arising in a particular course that you feel like there's some advanced training that needs, I'm happy to come in and provide additional um, more robust trainings than just a 50 minute thing before lunch. Um, so happy to do that. Please contact me at any time if you have any questions. If you ever get a letter and you're just scared out of your mind of what it says and what you did, just pick up the phone and give me a call. Um, I'm more than happy to talk to you about it in any part of your study. So. And with that, I will let you get to your sandwiches. Thank you very much, y'all.